share. Well, hi there. This is Pastor Ken Larson inviting you to worship with us at Trinity Lutheran Church at 8.30 and 10.30 on Sundays. Or you can visit online and uh, watch and join in on Sunday at those times or anywhere anytime after that. We also have Bible study Sundays at 9.30 um, at trinitydelray.org. Or you can watch that anytime, again, by going to YouTube. And do I have this correct, ladies, at Thursday morning at 9? That's correct, yes. Okay. Trinity Lutheran Church is located at 400 North Swinton in Delray Beach. And that's all I'm going to give you about us. I want to talk about the Bible this morning. And today, our, um, oh, what is it? Today... Isn't this interesting? The book of Malachi is 24 centuries old, but the prophet has much to say about today's pastors, apathetic churchgoers, man-centered lives that people are leading. So the question before us in this current study is what does the book of Malachi say to us today? This is our Bible study. It's one of uh, two or three. Now that uh, happens at Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. Malachi, though written the centuries ago, we're going to find that Malachi connects with the faith and the attitudes that describe today's churchgoers. Isn't that amazing? As the more things change, the more they remain the same. <laughs> what? I said the more they remain the same. Right. <laughs> Our history repeats itself, and there's good reasons to believe that that's true. <clears throat> history repeats itself because people fail to change. Malachi, it is good for congregations and pastors and unrepentant churchgoers. <laughs> mm. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. It's good, e good to study Malachi when there are money issues in the church. And I don't know of a congregation anywhere that doesn't or hasn't had uh, money issues. Money issues. And, and, and people say, I don't want to go to church. They're always asking for my money. Well, you know, I want to say to them, why don't you come and listen to what the Savior has to give you? And don't even listen to anything about offerings. Just tune out. Uh, read, your, uh, read your phone when the pastor talks about offerings and uh, don't, don't give anything until you have received your uh, gift of faith in Jesus. And that, <laughs> that'll put a stop to that. If you can get that far, it's also good for uh, apathetic worship. You see, Malachi is kind of this uh, all purpose of medicine. Uh, <laughs> what is, what is Malachi good for? I found this uh, down here. That what is Malachi good for? It's good for congregations and pastors and unrepentant churchgoers. It's also good for people living man-centered lives. Boy, that mirror that shows us uh, the number one God in our lives too often. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is it gonna give me? I don't get anything out of worship. All those excuses. I've heard them all. You know. Huh. It's also good for the infrequent witnesses to the God who has saved us. All right. I think we have been nailed here. <laughs> yeah, we have been nailed. So now here is a, a library. I don't know anybody that has a library that's this neat. But these are the books of the Bible, the books of Moses, yeah. and the history books. I want to pay uh, careful attention to these because they are in the same historical era, E-R-A, of Malachi. Okay. Here is Malachi. I think you knew that Malachi was the last book in the Old Testament. You knew that, didn't you? Yes. And, and here's the thing. Um, we're going to talk about it a little bit today. What happens between Malachi and Matthew? There's 400 years there. I'm going to bring that up later. It's also uh, good if uh, if you take out 
and read a little bit of Haggai. He has some of the same issues, and that's a short prophetic book. But the main things, if you will, while you're reading uh, Micah, excuse me, what did I say, Micah? <clears throat> while yeah. you're reading Malachi on your own, for background, for what's happening in that time, read these two people, um, Ezra the priest and Nehemiah the prophet. And they are working in the same century and uh, their ministries overlap Malachi a little bit, as we'll see a little bit in the in the timeline. Okay. Any questions about this this big library that God has given us? Oh, it, it's sixty six books, and I don't know something like one million nine hundred thousand words. <laughs> uh -huh. 1,179 chapters. One chapter a week will last you about three years. Excuse me, one chapter a day will last yeah. you about three years. That's pretty slow going. But boy, I read uh, Jeremiah 49 the other day, and it was two and a half pages long. I was like, oh, how will I get through this? I don't understand all this. <laughs> It is difficult reading, but this morning I finally finished. <laughs> I finally finished Jeremiah 52, and uh, I'm going to go read Lamentations. There's only three ver three chapters in Lamentations, and then I have to decide whether I want to go on into Ezekiel. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but okay. Um, you can also, um, if you dare. You can read a little bit of Daniel along with. So I've given you a lot to read. Take those books off the shelf in the next uh, month or two and uh, and fill out what it would be really challenging. <laughs> if you make a chart using as a timeline okay. the, the kings because you know that the Bible doesn't say in the year 430. Yeah. It doesn't say that because, you see, uh, there's an old story of a man who was uh, digging in uh, Rome's ruins and um, he uh, put his shovel down and he heard a clink and he, he dug a little more and there was a, a box and he opened the box and inside there were coins Oh, he thought these coins must be valuable. He picked up one of them and looked at it very closely. He couldn't read the Latin, except there was an inscription on the coin. And it said, 44 BC. Wow. Hmm. What, do you think, what do you think that coin was worth? Any guesses? What do you think that coin, you think that coin would have been very valuable? Oh, it should be before Christ, B.C. No, it was a fake. How do you know, Chris? How do you know it was a fake? Because they didn't know 44 B.C. was 44 B.C. That's right. That's the that's a great story. You can you can uh, tell other people. Um, <laughs> I heard that many years ago. <laughs> you realize what Chris is saying? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you didn't think of that. That's one of those, no. of those uh, puzzles. <laughs> so no. don't don't think about forty four BC. Um, I have a, an eraser here. How about that? So let's go on. I I just urge you, especially Ezra and Nehemiah. Get rid of that eraser too. So that's what Malachi is good for. So Pat. Clem uh, with Bobby will probably come in and join us, or maybe he'll probably be here <clears throat> later. Okay. <clears throat> now, I realize what we have been doing since last May. We've been on Zoom since the last week in May. Oh my God. And in the past year almost, we have studied 1 Samuel. That was a very interesting story. We did right. only the first uh, seven or eight chapters. 
and we studied prayer and we studied oh that took us a while didn't it to study the person and work of christ mm -hmm. and we had weeks and weeks of that and then we picked up discipleship i think i sprung that on you uh, oh you weren't expecting a course in discipleship and then we've spent oh about seven lessons on the lord's supper uh, we went in deeper than most of you have ever been. Well, who are the books of the Bible in that list? Um, yeah. Mm. yeah, I know. Now, every time we studied a topic, we looked up scads, yeah. right, of Bible verses. So right. there's two ways to come at Bible study, and one is to take a topic and look at all the times in the Bible that God speaks about that topic. Yeah. And you can do that with a concordance. You can do it for yourself. But in order to study a book like Malachi, you have to pick up the book of Malachi. It's only four chapters long. And let's talk about his name. Very short. It, it's a short name. It's not hard to pronounce. Thank you. Malachi. Some say Malachi, but not in our part of the world. And the name means messenger. Uh, it could be my messenger or my angel. Messenger and angel in the mm. Hebrew and the Greek are about the same. Mm. Okay. So there are even some people who say there wasn't ever a person named Malachi, but this is the name of the, the office that he, he held, his position, oh, but he doesn't have a name. I think that the reason uh, the people who have studied the Bible during the last 20 centuries, most of them have said, no, this is, this is a prophet. Because if you read the Jewish writings about the Bible, and there are many of them, beginning with the Talmud, you can get the Talmud off of the internet. You can read a lot about Jewish history. You can read Josephus. A long time ago, maybe 20 years, 30 years ago, the uh, teacher that I buried prematurely, but he's very much alive, Paul Meyer, uh, the second. Paul Meyer, just leave it at Paul that. Meyer, not, yeah. He just plain Paul Meyer, not no second, third, no. He wrote a new translation of Josephus mm -hmm. and added in historical references. It's a very valuable book. I think it's expensive too. And it would be hard uh, for me to read the dense and valuable history. But anyway, Malachi is the name of the last prophet of the Old Testament. Okay, what about Malachi? He's one of the minor prophets. Now, what does minor mean? Why do we call it a minor prophet? Usually it's, you're not as important or you're not spoken of as often. That's a good guess. Now, we have decided to call him uh, a minor prophet. That is not a designation that the Bible uses at all. <clears throat> but in our Pardon? Is that Chris? No. Okay. Why is it a minor prophet? Why are... Um, Hmm? This is Bob. Oh, hi, Bob. Good, good morning to you. We're studying Malachi, and welcome aboard. Yes. Malachi is an odd prophet. He's different. Hmm. But I want to address minor and major. Who are the major prophets? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then the fifth book is Lamentations. It's not a large book. Oh, that's the hint, isn't it? The major prophets are the long books, and the minor prophets are shorter books, much shorter. None of, none of the minor prophets have 52 chapters or anything like that. Hmm. So, but why do we say Malachi among the minor prophets is odd or different? Yeah, that, that's, uh, I'm curious about the odd. How is Malachi different from the other prophets? Significant way. 
it's a guess. I'm not sure that you would know. Uh, if you started reading it in chapter 1, verse 1. He was the last prophet. Yeah. After him, it was 400 years before the next prophet. That's right. There is no mention in Malachi of his father or mother or family. Um, Usually, the prophet is introduced by connecting him with his family. That's very important to us, isn't it? You are the daughter of somebody. Yeah. Okay. So there's no mention of a king ruling in Judah. Why, why are, why is there no mention of a king? Hmm. Maybe because there wasn't one? That's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> you were guessing, huh? Well, yes. the kings have been ridden out of town. When I finished Jeremiah today, uh, there, there was Nebuchadnezzar uh, taking Jehoiakim out of the... <laughs> And into, knocked his eyes out. Oh, terrible punishment. And But but then the next king in Babylon decided, uh, I'm going to let you out of prison and give you a monthly allowance. And he died blind, but there in captivity. But uh, having his freedom, whatever that meant in those days. But there's no king. There's no way of dating. Now, I said before that when you read the books of the Old Testament, they don't say 44 BC or 430 years before Christ, because as you've now realized, they didn't have those kinds of dates. The dating was done by how many years into what king's reign did this happen? Hmm. In the 11th year of King so-and-so, in the fourth month, on the 22nd day. And that's the kind of dating that you see when you read the prophets. And I suppose that when you read those books, your eyes just went over that rather quickly. But those are important in order to bring a timeline uh, to the Bible and have an idea for what things overlapped. One of the things that I didn't understand when we had to study history, when we had to study history, <laughs> you, if you didn't like history, you're going to identify with what I'm going to say is you didn't understand that history is not just the study of events and dates, but what else was happening at the time in the world, or especially in that part of the world. So when we study Luther, for example, we want to know who is ruling. Okay, who were the popes? Who was the emperor of the, the Roman Empire? Okay, we want to know the, the, re, the, the reign, and that affects uh, the ability of people to go about and do about what they want to do. I'm just talking about the dating. There's no way to date this book by a king's reign. There is, however, to, a way to date Malachi by the content of his prophecy. And we'll get into that. There's also, uh, that makes Malachi different from the others, is there's no mention of his call. You re you'll recall that Jeremiah was called when he was still in the womb. Mm -hmm. before you were born I knew you and I called you wow there was no way Jeremiah was going to do anything else but be a prophet of the Lord he was called uh, though he was hesitant at first so so also uh, Isaiah his call was very dramatic well a timeline can be constructed when you lay the events of the Bible alongside the events that we know from other historical surface uh, circumstances. For example, 
we can find out from the things that were recorded who was ruling in Babylon. Now, Babylon, you know, in 586 conquered Jerusalem and carried many of those people, that, the ones that he, they, he didn't destroy. <laughs> they were devoted to destruction. Some people don't like that, but it happened. Uh, the ones that he didn't destroy, he carried into captivity in Babylon. And he left some, some behind to take care of the, the vines and to plow. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerusalem, however, was totally uh, conquered, burned. He went in and he had all the houses burned. All the walls were knocked down. It was a ruin and Nebuchadnezzar expected it would never rise again. Ha ha. <laughs> joke, mm -hmm. joke on you, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, then we have Cyrus, and he can be dated. He is ruling in, in Persia, and he conquered Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar gets his just deserves, and uh, Babylon falls. This is the story of history. One nation conquers another, and then they get conquered. You've read that, huh? Um, uh, what happens is that uh, Cyrus, on order from the Lord, and no one knows exactly how he got that, uh, and Darius also following that same order. Here's Darius the first, first uh, the king of Persia. They give money and valuable supplies to those who are returning to Jerusalem to rebuild. They get not a loan, but a gift. And this is amazing that God enabled these rulers who are not religious people, not uh, followers of the God of Israel. Uh, they uh, help put things back together again with money and supplies and valuables. And even the temple vessels are returned to the exiles who now go back. About 50,000 returned. Zechariah and Haggai were beginning their uh, work of prophesy, uh, prophesying about the same time. So do you see how we get our dates? by looking at who was ruling at the time. The temple was completed in about 515 BC. Ezra is also, uh, he's the priest, he goes to Jerusalem and he sets up reforms, uh, changes to put the people back in the Lord's ways as far as worship and offerings and so forth. And Nehemiah the prophet is doing the same kind of ministry. These are interesting books to read, and they aren't, they aren't as hard to read. These are not, uh, uh, Ezra is in the, uh, and Nehemiah are in the history books, not in the prophets. And then uh, they are enabled, Nehemiah, uh, uh, they're, they're uh, enabled, under Nehemiah, they're enabled to rebuild the walls. So here we finally get that Malachi begins his prophetic ministry at, we believe, around 430 B.C. Does that timeline help a little bit? It helps me. You have any questions about the timeline and why we're looking at his historical context? About 150 years from Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. This, this is, a, is a very deep time. Yes, it's a very difficult time. But yeah. you know, the Israelites who returned, as, as you know, Pastor, the Israelites were eager to restore uh, the place of worship. Mm -hmm. It was under God's command that they did this. Mm. All right. So that is good that they did. And, and God has a reason to do this. All right, we'll see that. There are some unique uh, features of Malachi's prophecy. Let me emphasize three of them. One is the dialogue that goes on between God and the people, or between God and the priests. 
God says something, and then there's a contrast. But you say, and then God answers their objection. It's like an argument, or, or, or if you want to put a nicer word, you could say a debate between God and, and the priest, or between God and the people. And this is written in Malachi's prophecy. And eventually, we believe, it was read to the people so that they would see how God has put their arguments to silence. <laughs> Doesn't he always? But you say, and you'll read that, I think it's 13 times in the book of Malachi. Mm -hmm. So it's a feature. Mm -hmm. There's also great contrast between um, the sin and forgiveness between God's righteousness and man's unrighteousness, between uh, the unloving things that people did and then the loving things that God promised them. Hmm. Great book of contrasts. Most of the prophets are. And this is something that we ought to take to heart in our day. One of the things I'm trying to do in Malachi is to show how Malachi connects to what we are doing today in the year of our Lord, uh, 2021. That's a long time ago, but God never gives up. He <laughs> seeks his people. Uh, someone wrote a poem, I can't think of his name anymore, Ah, called The Hound of Heaven. Uh, yes. Who? I remember that. Yeah, the, yeah the, the hound of heaven. It's You know what a hound does? He'll just keep on seeking the prey. Mm. So, so Malachi is not so unique. It's like the other prophets, like the other prophetic books. There's always a call to repentance. Mm -hmm. So here's my first question of you people. Um, I've been doing all the talking. It's about time that I <laughs> gave you a chance to respond and um, ask your questions. But here, take this question. Why is the call to repentance never out of date? People are already always sinning. Yes. Why does God want us to repent? Because we're sinners. Because right. we're sinners. Well, he wants, he wants us to... Uh... He wants us to talk to him. <laughs> yes, he does. And it's one of the means and many times and through prayer or uh, asking that we, uh, we, we do talk to him. Uh, What's repentance? What is repentance? When you're sorry for <clears throat> now, One of the problems of Zoom is that... Uh, only one person can talk, and if three people try, uh, we hear uh, nothing. Um, Evelyn, you said something. Repent. Uh, when we repent, we're telling God that we're sorry for our sins, and um, yeah. we want to come back to him. All right, sorrow. Another answer. Chris, sir. Wasn't me, but I think um, um, the lady in green. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I don't. You, you remember? It. You remember this from a sermon or two that you've heard in the last few years, right? Here, I'm going to draw a picture. <laughs> well, we're just sin we're just sinful creatures and i mean we sin even without uh, those sins of omission and commission that we don't even know that we do yes but i'm saying that repentance is uh, the the greek word i can't write here because you you can't write with this pen very well this is a u turn you're going the wrong way and repentance is turning from sin uh, to righteousness you want to get back on the right path yeah. with God. Okay. Metanoia. Okay. It's a long subject. We could study it for a week or two. 
But repentance is never out of date, as you said, because we are sinners and we continue to, I need to repent. And I prayed this morning, I was thinking of a particular sin of omission and it was really bothering me. Well, what's the solution to that? Forgiveness? Yes, but where, where's the change? God says to me. All right, not all day on one word. Malachi presents, as it were, the last straw. And maybe you had parents who finally said to you one day, I'm not going to hound you on that anymore. This is the last straw. Uh, you are, I don't know what they did uh, in your day. You're grounded for a month or something. Today they take away the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that's that destroys a teenager's life it's the last straw i'm not going to speak to you anymore and afterward there is no prophetic voice from god as you said for four centuries Why? you know god had been talking to his people since the days of moses and now nothing this is, to whom is this prophecy addressed? I'm not talking about us yet, just in that day. To whom in that day is this prophecy addressed? Would it have been to, <clears throat> to Israel and, um, well, to everyone living in that time? All right. And the, and the priests? Specifically to God's people. The heathen are not listening. Um, they are not part of the address of Malachi. So just God's people. And in particular, you see Israel, the northern kingdom, which in the second part of the Old Testament goes by the name Israel. Israel used to be the entire nation. But then there was the division. We have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom was known as uh, Judah. Anybody know? Judah. Judah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes the law. And he's addressing the priests and the people. Nobody is left out. The priests of Judah and the people who were part of that nation. And there's only two subjects, <laughs> sin and grace. Malachi. Sin and grace, Malachi. So my question, I should have had that. Do you know what I did this week is I said, I'm going to put uh, addresses to you, questions to you in white. I didn't do this one. Okay. But you see what I want to make it clear to you that when I want, uh, I'm looking for a response. You can talk anytime, but and I want your questions. But my question of you is: anything changed in the last 2,400 years? Um, yeah, Christ. Christ came into the world. <laughs> That's a yeah. You got me there. Yeah. I'm talking about people and their lives. I think yes, because there's more distractions. We have so many distractions. Yeah, they didn't have TV and the internet and so forth. So they had distractions. Uh, they were just different. They had work. I was thinking is how long would it would take them to make a tool out of brass? They, they had to put the, the, the ore inside of an iron kettle. But first they had to go get an iron kettle. So who made the iron kettle? And then they built a fire under the iron kettle, put the ore in it and, and let it sit there on the high with a with a bellows to make the fire hot, the very hot. And this was the first uh, smelter. And I've always wondered, how do they figure out how to smelt? So, but really the answer to this question is nothing has changed. There is still sin against the God who says, don't sin. 
So here's a particular question, and it is in white. What do people lie about today, now, in our time? Oh, boy. <laughs> what else is new? Yeah, what else is new? Exactly, Pastor. What do people lie about now? Give me some examples. They lie about sin, but I, I'm not giving examples, you know. No, that's a good example because people lie about sin by denying their sin mm -hmm. or by denying that a particular wrong is sin or they don't believe there is sin at all. See? So they do lie about sin. What else do they lie about? They lie about their actions. They do one thing and say another thing. Yeah. Inconsistencies. It's in interesting the way we talk about they, you know, those people out there. <laughs> um, after we get done, you look in the mirror. What do people lie about? Well, uh, we to, can... to see, huh? We should be, we should be so good about it. <laughs> Tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. I think my the father... Arms have not changed at all. No. Uh, I think my father was a little bit like um, this guy in the television series that uh, Jeannie and I have watched. And uh, he could look at a person's face and say, well, you're not a very good liar. Believe it. They lie about God and they lie about divorce and they lie about marriage. They lie about truth. Say it doesn't exist or your truth is different than my truth. They don't believe there is one truth. People lie about their neighbor. They lie about their lives and their money. And they brag about their accomplishments, which are nothing. <laughs> People yeah. lie. Has anything yeah. changed? Nope, nothing's new under the sun. Think about all the lies people have told you over your lifetime. That's a, a large pile, isn't it? How do you react to people telling you lies? How do you feel? Uh, not trustworthy. It destroys trust. Mm -hmm. uh, if a man lies to his wife once, and she catches him. You'll never trust him again. <laughs> that is unfortunately often true. Once the brick wall of truth is knocked down by one lie, how do you build it back again? Every husband has, <laughs> I confess, I don't know whether Ginny is <laughs> going to watch this or not, but I'm being truthful about about my my sin of lies i had reasons but they weren't very good men don't uh, men lie to their wives in order to the, they say protect <laughs> that's how it seems at the time how do you react when you know that you are being lied to oh, some people fall, actually fall away in their faith um, to the Lord. Through their lies, yeah. How do you react or feel when you know that a person's lying, as they say, through their teeth? Betrayed. Betrayed. You never trust them again. You don't want to trust them. Oh. I have a friend who exaggerates and in the sense that's the same as a lie about yeah. his past, although he's done a lot of things. He was my husband's friend. And and I just, because I've known this person for 30 years or so, I just like, oh yeah, that's him. You know, I don't believe hardly much of what he says. In right. fact, no, he's not telling the all truth, but mm -hmm. yeah can't seem to help it when it comes to how great he was in his other life, you know. Yeah. In my own eyes, I am, I am conqueror of all the problems that come up. Our um, disposal began leaking. Jenny called <laughs> yesterday. I was in the <laughs> office studying and she said, 
Uh oh, problem. And she said uh -huh. in her voice uh, that was uh, serious. I had to come right away, not I'll be there in a minute. It's 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 the uh, voice that says, you'd better come here right away because there is a problem and the disposal is leaking. Well, we uh, saw that very quickly. Uh, I made a phone call. I put in the last one and it lasted, I don't know how many years and now, but it wasn't about the lie. It was, I, I'm so glad that I can, I have accomplished many things, yeah. but I don't, I don't have the right to brag about them. Ask Jeannie. Uh, what about when the lies pile up like last week's garbage? They begin to stink. He's working right now. <laughs> you can hear the you can hear the tractor. Okay. Fortunately, we we don't have that problem. Sometimes. Uh, what, what happens when you find yourself caught in your own lies? I was going to say you? sometimes when lies build up over a, a long period of time. Right. Uh, you almost begin to believe they are the truth instead of um, the falsehood. People, people, yes. people yeah. refer to them as being truth. Right. I think that normalcy. Uh, well, Chris? whatever. Chris, I think, well, I think that's the problem with this uh, uh, old friend. You know, he's in his mid eighties now, and he's still doing it like he had the most adventurous life, which he did, but you know, I know they're exaggerated because I was there. Yeah. Not 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 next to him, but you know, right. in the community. Yeah. You, you begin to believe your own lies. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what how, how do you feel when you are caught in your own lies? Yeah, terrible. Oh God. <laughs> is, is that embarrassing? Yes. Uh, you you hang your head? Uh, Excuse me, I don't want to cough into the microphone, so I mute. So when you're caught, you must say, well, I'm sorry, that, that isn't true at all. People mm -hmm. can regress and pull away. Uh, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, if, if you were going to church and somebody called you out on your own lie, you might start turning away from the church or not coming anymore and, uh, and regress away from, uh, from your faith and the truth. Okay. I have a problem where people might think I'm lying when I talk about the things that have happened to me in my life, which I know they happened, but it's like, no, that you didn't do that, you know, or I don't mean bad things, but you know, right. Working for the Indians and but a lot of stuff, you know, it's like, oh yeah, they roll their eyes. Well, you have your own ways of dealing with that. We're almost out of time here, almost out of time. And I, I want to summarize what, <coughs> pardon me, that Malachi, God's last word in the Old Testament, he speaks a word of judgment. Judgment is coming. It's, there's going to be a judgment against those who lie in God's name. And this, this is something that is really serious. When people lie in, in God's name and they mm -hmm. say something and they say, this is what the Lord said when he didn't say that. Ooh, what, yes. what God says in the Old Testament about these lying prophets, I yes. never sent them. I never sent I never them. That. I never said that. There is a judgment that Malachi delivers, as I said before. We'll call it the last straw. That's it. You can hear him. You can hear him kind of doing this. But God isn't through with his people, and his love has not ended. The good news of the New Testament is going to be delivered. Christ is going to come. Malachi speaks of that coming. And that's what we're going to continue with next time if he allows us the chance to get together. I'm again, I'm thankful to you and your faithfulness. 
the, the five or six or seven of you who uh, join us and the 15 or 20 or more that um, will watch oh. this later on. I don't know who they are. They don't sign in. They just they just come and I can see the number. After a week or two, I see how many people have joined us. And I'm grateful to you people who who join us after we do this and our good people like Aaron put it up on the YouTube for you to watch anytime. I don't know how long it stays there. So please uh, uh, pray for the people on the prayer list that I'll send to you again. Okay. Read the book of Malachi. It's not very long. You can read it in about 20 minutes, not for understanding, but just to breeze through and get the general tone of it. And then we'll study it uh, after we get through with this. Oh, um, one more week of introduction, I think. We have a lot to cover. But I'll try to rush along and then give you time for your questions. It's, um, let's see, 45, 40, we're about 47 minutes in. Do you have any questions uh, before we sign out today? <coughs> Malachi speaks a word of judgment. Is Malachi kind of at the, since it's at the end of the Old Testament, is it kind of similar to like Revelations being at the end of the New Testament? I never thought of that, Judy. I never thought about the position. The position was um, determined mm -hmm. by the Jewish people who put those books together and I uh, of course they couldn't see wow. they couldn't see the end of the New Testament era but they could see that it was God's final final word and there were no prophetic books after them in in what way are the two books comparable what what the book of Revelation tells us is that there will be a judgment, but that God's people will be spared, and there is victory of Jesus Christ over the evil one, over the devil. Mm -hmm. That's the main message of Revelation. It's couched in, in very difficult and um, language. Okay, but that is, there is a judgment coming, and there is mercy to the house of God, to those people who, who are kept in the faith by his mighty word. The word of the gospel is a word of forgiveness. It is a word of God's mercy. Grace. Interesting. Esther, you're muted. Any other questions or comments? It's so prevalent. Yeah, we take I'm, it for granted, Pastor. I want to uh, I want to sign out now, but I'm going to talk with you in a, just a minute uh, after okay. we, after we pray. That's good, Lord, Lord God. Uh, you gather us together, and one of your purposes is to announce to us that you hate sin in every in every way that it erupts within our lives. We not we do not always do what we could do for others. We do not love others the same way that we are in love with ourselves. And we don't love you with our whole heart, soul, and mind strength. So we must repent and believe and believe that you sent Jesus, your son, into the world to be a sufficient sacrifice for all of our sins. Teach us to speak the truth with our neighbor and to love them and to find ways of serving you in our church, in our community, in our nation, and in the simple thing of praying to you and asking on behalf of Jesus Christ to grant healing, help, and comfort to those who are ill. We ask this and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. Amen.